having their purchasing power increase pressure on the supply again with the decreased focus in other on other sectors of the economy. Goods or final products from other sectors of the economy go down. So there is increased importation of goods and services, which exerts pressure on the currency. There is also increase in the incidence of corruption because most government officials or most public officials find themselves entangled as key actors in the resource sector. This caused various governance gaps in the extractive sector and undermine other economic sectors. With resource sector being unsustainable or revenues being unsustainable due to external shocks and uh, possible depletion in the future, this phenomenon can lead to a downturn of the economy instead of leading to the growth of the economy. You can read this to see some extracts that were found from a report from the Economic Commission for Africa. Another economic impact is the impact on people's livelihood. As I mentioned earlier, mining operations begin with the clearing of vegetation. So, if, for instance, during the exploratory stage, the mining area that was located are farmlands, that would mean that all those farmlands will be lost, will be taken away from the communities and through some um, laid down procedure, compensation packages will be given them and the farms taken over to um, prepared for extractive activities. Unfortunately, most communities in these areas are farmers. Therefore, loss of their farmlands means loss of their livelihoods. One key thing that we do not take notice is the fact that during the compensation process, usually the compensation is, attached to, is attached to ownership. land ownership. However, when you visit these communities, may not necessarily be the owners of the land. Either the, they are high risk by the owner or the owner may have leased the land to them to cultivate. Therefore, where they are, the land is lost to mining activity, but compensation only focuses on the owner, that would mean that all those who depended on the land before the mining activities may have lost their source of livelihood. This is with the assumption that perhaps the owner will use his compensation to start a new enterprise and, and therefore get um, a source of livelihood. But the question is, what happens to the high risk? What happens to those who were uh, cultivating the land prior to the mining operation, they all lose their source of livelihoods. And that is a major economic impact of extractive activities. We've already talked about loss of access to uh, portable water. But one thing I will also want to add to the impacts of livelihood or um, the loss in um, human settlement, yes, the earlier slide, is that just like the loss of farmlands, compensation to the loss of homes are also tied to ownership in most cases. The ICMM has come out with um, some principle, guiding principles to guide the calculation of compensation packages, such that compensation packages will not only involve 
or consider owners of houses or owners of uh, farmlands or owners of any other resource that will be lost to make way for extractive activity. But we'll also consider the dependent so that the extractive activity will not leave dependent on that resource impoverished. When we come to home settlement, particular focus is to be given to vulnerable households. Thus, all those households who live in a particular house and are headed by females should be considered in the compensation package. Similarly, when it comes to loss of farmlands, dependents of the farmlands should be considered and not just the owner. Now let's move to the impact on climate. The impact of extractive activities on climate is enormous. Despite the environmental impact assessment, it's still difficult to control how the, uh, the environmental risk that mining activities pose to the environment. We have heavy emissions of carbon dioxide and this starts from one, the clearing of the forest cover to make way for extractive activities. Because we all know that the forest absorbs some considerable amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in exchange, give humans and other living habitats um, oxygen. With the clearing of the vegetation means that we have lost the opportunity that we used to have to absorb the carbon emissions. Be as it may, the mining activity itself also emits considerable amount of carbon dioxide. Because as we know, in the energy sector, or the production and consumption of energy have been cited as the leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions over 60 to 70%. And the mining sector consumes significant amount of energy or uses significant amount of energy in its operations and the production of the final uh, product. Therefore, with the loss of vegetation and significant consumption of energy, we have significant carbon emissions into the atmosphere. According to a study by CSIRO Minerals of Australia, for every kilogram of copper and nickel that is produced, an amount of between 3.3 and 16 kilograms of carbon dioxide are emitted, meaning that we emit more greenhouse gases for each kilogram of metal that is produced, where there are no um, vegetation to as much vegetation as before to absorb those carbon emissions. So now, what are some of the measures that can be taken to control or um, to mitigate uh, carbon emissions in extractive activities? Generally, controlling um, carbon emissions have been a fight by the UNFCCC. This culminated into the 2015 Paris Agreement where countries yearly um, submit or review their uh, nationally determined contributions uh, to show their targets, how they are working to ensure that uh, we achieve the global target of below two degrees Celsius of temperature levels. Uh, specifically to the extractive sector, one thing that can be done is the adoption of new technologies. Thus, to increase the level of productivity of the mining uh, operations, 
that will perhaps shorten the mining life cycle and also reduce the consumption of energy in the production of metals and other final products. Improved ventilation, efficient transport systems, among others. Extractive companies can also consider other carbon-free energy sources that are being talked about worldwide in order to control their carbon footprint. Okay, so away from the climate, climate impact, generally, there are some measures that can be adopted in order to manage the environmental and social impact of extractive activities. We have three main measures. We have the avoidance measures, mitigation measures, and the compensation measures. The avoidance measure Some um, measures or some um, the, the project is modified in a manner that completely avoid the negative impact that was identified. This can be done through the adoption of uh, new technologies and maybe uh, changing the, the geographical location altogether. Another measure is the mitigation. Um, guidelines are put in place to reduce the extent of the impact on either the environment or the socioeconomic lives of the population. We also have the compensation measures, which include maintaining or improving the conservation system of the biodiversity. That's adopting certain key principles to make up for the destruction that has been made. But these three measures are not adopted at a goal. You can choose which measure you want depending on the implementing entity or the timeline that it takes to implement the measure or more importantly, the cost of applying such a measure. Another key factor that informs the type of um, measure that uh, is adopted is the monitoring and the follow-up procedures involved. Also is the duration that it takes to ensure effective monitoring of the full application of the measure and the costs involved in such monitoring activities. Also significant is the institutional capacity to implement such a measure and monitor it all together effectively. So we have general measures and specific measures. The general measure are usually what is contained in the legal framework of the jurisdiction within which the mineral extraction is going on. So we have the environmental provisions, we have the regulatory measures that state agencies are supposed to enforce compliance among private entities. We also have measures in relation to the information, education, and communication of the full impact of extractive activities to all stakeholders involved. We also have the specific measures. Specific measures has got to do with the mine-specific measure. Thus, the specific impact identified or peculiar to the various mines. And you come out with a specific measure that deal with that specific mine. This can differ based on the mine or based on the location of the mine, or even the type of mineral being mined. So um, let's quickly go through um, what we mean by the general measures, as I've already mentioned. So general measures 
are usually the ones that have been outlined in our legal framework. They are the ones that have been outlined in um, our regulatory or our regulations in uh, which are overseen by um, state agencies such as environmental protection agencies, the forestry commission, the water resources uh, unit and all that. So these are there and uh, just apply to any activity that has to do or interact with the environment and the ecosystem as well as the population. So some of the, these are some of the examples of regulatory measures. Um, popular among them is the environmental impact assessment. As I mentioned in recent years, social impact assessment has been integrated as part of the environmental impact assessment. So we have environmental, social, environmental and social impact assessment. All right, so why will general measures fail to mitigate the full impact of extractive activity on the environment? So we have countries do not have environmental regulation during exploration. Usually limited focus is given to the level of pollution that could um, um, create environmental risk during the exploration stage, because during the exploration stage, there is not much digging, there's not much deep digging. It's just some um, um, small digging to study the rock properties and ascertain the, 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 the grades, the mineral grades, and also um, the size and all that. So um, states usually fail to, um, um, incorporate that level of um, environmental impact during the exploration stage. Usually the, explore, the EIA is usually done after the exploration and um, the company has maybe now have a business case to go ahead with the mining. That's when they undertake the environmental impact assessment by which if there been any pollution during the exploration stage, it may have happened and there would have been no mitigation measure to alleviate the full impact of such um, an activity. One, number two also is insufficient fund, funds. Yesterday, I mentioned that usually during mine closure, not a lot of focus, emphasis or monitoring activities is done to ensure that the place is um, adequately rehabilitated or possibly reclaimed for other purposes, even if not for um, farming. Again, also is the insufficient capacity of government agencies to review impact assessment or monitor compliance. A lot of times this IE, uh, EIA is conducted by the companies themselves. And sometimes, um, although um, state agencies verify, but they may not have um, adequate staff to ascertain the debts that the company claims were done. So we just um, accept whatever the company brought and issue their certificate. Measures related to information, education and communication. Due to the multifaceted risk that I've talked about, it's critical that stakeholders that we interact with the extractive um, operations are educated and informed about the various risks so that they will know how to manage their level of interaction with the mining area. And specifically, we can have, um, let workers understand why they always need to be in their PPEs whilst working at the mine area. Community awareness uh, for community to understand the potential environmental risk 
and um, social risk and economic risk, and also uh, health awareness uh, involve health officials to educate the communities on preventive in order to uh, and how to avoid respiratory infections from the things that can be done as so impacts on groundwater so you can see impacts on surface water and how we can manage the air quality. This may differ from mining area to mining area, depending on the category of risk that it exposes the community and the environment to. Yeah, it continues from here, soil contamination, management of biodiversity, waste management, and finally, restoration of the uh, mine area after mine closure and decommissioning. So in conclusion, what we will say is that, yes, mining activity is not a bad thing. It's a catalyst for economic growth and development if properly managed. However, if not properly managed, can expose um, the environment and the people, uh, the people mainly those in the rural communities who interface directly with the mine area to some social and economic impact. Although there are legal instruments which require environmental and social assessment for extractive activities. There are times that um, capacity of state institutions and also funds and other things inhibit the full compliance and the full enforcement of these legal instruments. All right, so we will bring it to an end here. And one thing that we also say is that sometimes um, the, the impact could be dire, especially in the case of artisanal small scale mining. And worst of all, illegal miners who are outside the control of um, the regulatory institutions has become difficult to get them to comply with any environmental measure. There you have it. We have some references and reading list. If you want more information, do well to refer to the references, just Google them, check on them and read more on the topic. If you need further responses, feel free to drop in your comments or your questions in the comment section of the course platform. Thank you very much and um, hope to interact with you more. Bye-bye.